So, um, hi everyone. Uh, so, I'm, um, <coughs> um, I'm Alex Bradbury. Um, I work at uh, Low Risk CIC, where we work on um, open source um, hardware, RISC V designs, and we've been uh, driving the effort to um, support uh, RISC V in upstream LVM. So, today's talk, I'm going to give a I've sort of split it into a few sections. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background and some preliminaries, um, a little bit of insight into what it actually means to port a compiler like LVM to RISC V. Um, then I'll talk a bit about um, how I've gone about the task, um, some design decisions, and then pick off a few topics which I felt were maybe representative of the sort of, uh, um, the sort of uh, design decisions and tasks that um, we've been taking on in this effort. I'll, of course, uh, give a bit of a summary of current status and then a, um, an idea of where we're heading in the future. Can you talk about now? Yeah, <coughs> I can try. So, first of all, um, what is LVM? LVM is a uh, popular um, compiler infrastructure. It has a, a permissive license uh, just in the last couple of weeks changed to Apache from a BSD-style license. It has a library-based uh, design, which many people find um, uh, useful. We may integrate it into our projects. Um, and it's uh, often used um, paired with the Clang language front end, which is um, the equivalent of GCC in terms of giving C and C++ support. And as we'll t um, touch on later, um, very there's uh, a number of other language languages which have used it as their back end, uh, most notably Rust, um, which I know is one reason why a lot of the distro people are particularly interested in um, the status of LVM RISC V code generation and Swift, Julia, and other such languages. <clears throat> and so LVM provides a sort of common infrastructure, a common set of passes, analyses, optimizations, transformations in order to provide, um, to implement uh, basically a whole, a whole suite of compilation related tasks. So there's the uh, LVM and its code generator, but there's also a family of projects, including Linker, Debugger, um, C++ Runtime, uh, so Compiler RT, the equivalent of the low level of libgcc um, library, and a growing suite of projects as people um, upstream and contribute new things, OpenMP implementations, uh, Sickle coming from Intel soon. And so, uh, why are people interested in LVM? Um, why are interested in LVM for RISC-V? I think there are a number of reasons. Um, I think first of all, I um, should make completely clear that GCC for RISC-V is in fantastic shape. Um, uh, people have been using it to compile a whole bunch of things. So if, there's, if you just want a working compiler, GCC is there. It's ready to go right now, well supported. There are a range of, um, of pre-compiled versions available, people upstreaming and uh, increasingly cross-compiled tool chains upstreamed into distro repositories. Um, but there are a number of people who prefer LVM either for uh, licensing reasons um, or because that they rely on it as the back end for program language. Uh, so Rust is um, perhaps the most notable example and um, as I'm sure we'll be hearing later, it's becoming a dependency for any modern distro right now with librsvg and other, and other libraries being ported. Um, I think another <coughs> LVM's also had very good uptake in uh, academia, research, and R&D. Um, one of the reasons is that it's uh, actually very easy to modify and add support for custom extensions. There's a very active developer community, and we could argue back and forth about GCC versus LVM, but certainly there's a sort of a, uh, a locus of interest around it for um, new and interesting um, compiler analyses and transformations. So I'm just going to give a little bit of a brief overview of what a um, Clang um, LVM uh, compilation flow looks like, um, which we'll sort of use to talk about the, um, the tasks that we take on when porting something like LVM to a new architect to support a new architecture. So it, of course, has your C input. So in the case of um, LVM and Clang, this, you put this through your C front end. And when porting it to an architecture, to be honest, there's basically there's very little you need to do to the, um, to the Clang front end. Um, you need to add support for um, the set of command line options which get passed through to the back end. Um, a few uh, teach it a little bit about the target architecture so it can, pro so it can provide um, appropriate diagnostics. Um, but beyond that, it's you know, order of a few hundred lines. 
So we have our C input. This gets, um, eventually we get, we get through to, this gets passed, we get the Clang AST, and that will eventually spit out LVMIR, which probably most of you have seen in some form um, at, least, at least once. Uh, so this is a, so unlike um, GCC, this is exposed to the end user or the people who want to feed it in to, um, feed it in as input to LVM, um, so people can actually uh, pass that um, using other tools if you wanted to do your own, um, do your own stuff with it. Though in practice, most people implement their own um, extensions to LVM using the uh, library-based extension mechanism. Um, so as you see, we've, we've uh, sort of lowered the C types in a fairly trivial way. Um, you know, int32t becomes LVM's IR type I32, and um, it, LVM IR has its own set of instructions and semantics. Uh, and one sort of common misconception um, is that it's a uh, that it's some sort of universal uh, IR in the sense that WebAssembly or other projects are trying to be. So once you've got to LVM IR, you've actually already made a, a number of target-specific. Uh, assumptions, um, which you need to do in order to sort of meet the CABI and maintain the semantics for your input. So once we have the LVM, the next step from that is then pus putting that through the compiler middle end, and eventually this gets um, this goes through a sort of a process which spits out what's called a selection DAG. And we're not going to go into details of that because it's not particularly relevant to what I'm talking about today. But the um, I guess the point is. Uh, so the everything that's going on on the sort of on the LVM IR level that's mostly sort of target independent and shared. So it's um, all the same code for ARM, uh, ARCH64, x86, Power, and so on. Whereas once you get to this step, um, you've actually you've you've done all of your target independent transformations and analyses. Um, this is where the sort of porting effort comes in. So you're able to make use of a whole um, set of you know, libraries and helper functions, um, but the task is essentially to take um, this uh, selection DAG and to lower it to um, our final form, which is the output assembly or ELF object. So in this case, it's all fairly trivial because ultimately we have a single, a single IR instruction, the add, um, which gets lowered to um, a little bit of extra um, uh, extra extra junk in order to handle the uh, function arguments and return, as well as the, um, the main meat of it, this um, selection DAG add node, um, which is trivially then lowered to the um, add instruction. So that's given a bit of a sort of high level overview of the sort of things that you would take on while porting something like LVM. Uh, so this includes, uh, so LVM for a number of years now includes an integrated assembler. Um, so that's a fairly relatively straightforward task of just supporting the RIS-5 uh, assembler, the syntax. Uh, we start looking at defining... Oh. Sorry. <clears throat> So you've implemented your assembler, um, and that's actually where I started with the RIS-5 LVM port, as to provide a sort of uh, base, uh, a, a sort of solid base on which to build everything on top of. Um, you'll, the next task you'll want to take on is doing for something like defining the instructions. So what is a, uh, which instructions does the architecture support and how are they encoded? So I'll just show a, um, Slightly verbose example over the next few slides, um, but um, you don't need to sort of study the whole thing. And I'll sort of step through these, the rest of these with examples actually. So this is the exploded definition of a single instruction in LVM. And of course, you don't need to write this when defining um, your new target. Um, this is using the, um, it's a domain specific language called table gen. Uh, so this is uh, specifying that we have a up here. So we have a RIS-5 instruction and add. The assembler syntax looks like this at the bottom, and we have a whole bunch of uh, encoding. So actually, I've highlighted on the next slide, these are the lines that are relevant to encoding the instruction for target architecture, and these are the lines which are relevant for the assembly parser, which is actually mostly generated for you, um, and for specifying the inputs and outputs of the instruction. But of course, this is um, verbose painful. If you had to write that for every instruction, it would become rather tiresome and not particularly 
uh, easy to maintain. Um, so it's, um, you start adding in um, sort of classes which, um, are, or which are a feature of the table gen DSL, um, which mean that ultimately you're in, you can specify instructions using a fairly straightforward form such as this, which defines all of the register register instructions in the base RIS5 ISA. So that's enough in order to, um, provided that you have enough support code around it, that's enough to have generate your, um, your parser, the assembly parser, and um, to actually produce object code from that. Um, but we also want to handle um, the more uh, common case, which is when you have um, LVMIR input from Clang, Rust, Julia, or um, whatever else, and you want to uh, work out how to convert that to RISC V instructions. And so that involves um, both writing C++ logic for more complicated cases, but in a simple case, such as an ad, um, you just write uh, these um, patterns. So these are just uh, sort of, uh, uh, so th these are patterns on nodes of a selection DAG. So it's just a, a um, direct a cyclic graph specifying that if you have an ad node, which looks like this, convert it to a RISC V instruction, which looks like this. And I mean, at a, from a high level, that's basically what it involves, going through each of the, each of the instructions, supporting that, um, implementing patterns in this way. And then most of, the, most of the fiddly work is kind of around the edges. It's uh, uh, ensuring that the stack frames are set up properly, that um, the ABI is maintained, that um, various corner cases come up which are handled properly. Of course, with RISC-5, we have, um, it, it isn't just a single target. And although um, over time, other architectures have also gained a whole range of different, uh, different features and different options, I think uh, RIS-5 is, um, it, it's, it's, they, they don't tend to be exercised simultaneously. Um, so although, over, so there's, so, so essentially we have uh, three base um, ISA definitions. So RV32I, RV32E, which is when you have only 16 registers, or RV64I. But then you have the question of, do you support the multiply, atomics, um, single precision floating point, double precision floating point, the compressed extension, and that's all fine. That's fairly um, straightforward. It's quite, you know, every architecture, x86 adds new, ex new extensions with every Intel, Intel chip released. Um, but there's also a whole range of ABIs um, attached to that. So whether it's um, the, which is specified in terms of um, XLEN, so the, whether it's RV32 or RV64, and then indicating whether, so just ILP32 would mean that um, it is essentially the soft flow ABI. ILP32F is single precision, hard float for single precision, which means that your um, argument, floating point arguments are passed by registers. Um, and similarly for L ILP32D and LP64D and so on. And the way that the RISC V ABIs are defined, it's actually um, pretty easy to handle these with a single function, which is parameterized by um, the uh, floating, supported floating point length and the supported and the general purpose register length. Uh, but in terms of testing, um, you can see that there's you know, once you start um, multiplying all these options, there's uh, quite a lot to cover there. Um, and there's more to come as people are uh, introducing new um, custom and standard extensions and introducing uh, new custom or standard ABIs. So the, RISC the, uh, the port of RISC-V LVM, um, back in the early days of RISC-V, just when it was making its way out of Berkeley, there was a GTC port, which um, some of Berkeley students had developed, and there was an initial LVM port. Um, and ultimately, um, I actually went and waited around, around a bit to see what was happening. Um, I'd previously been uh, working on a LVM port for a, a research architecture at Cambridge, um, a large number of very simple in-order cores, but with its own ISA. So I kind of got quite up to speed on LVM backend development through that. And I think we'd found that the, uh, the initial RISC-V LVM port, although people managed to do some useful things with it, it was quite some way away from being ready for um, um, being committed upstream. Uh, so I sort of started a fresh effort trying to work in a very step-by-step 
taking a very step-by-step -step methodical approach, ensuring that everything was well tested, unit tested, and to the extent that I was able to, documented. And um, I guess over the past uh, uh, 18 months or so, I've been able to get a bit of funding, which has helped to sort of increase the time I can spend on this. Um, I'll say more about status uh, a little bit later, but we've, there's now, um, this started as a, um, as a downstream project, but with the intent of getting it upstream very quickly. Um, LVM has a pre-commit review policy, which in the early days, it took quite a while to actually get things up there. Um, but um, that's sort of sped up substantially now that there are more people interested. I'm the upstream code owner, so that's, um, um, th th things get got much easier in that respect. And so, uh, so at this point, there are, I guess, the, the sort of uh, high-level view of the, of the current status is that it's, it's not there yet for um, hard float on uh, Linux targets, um, but I'm targeting the next LVM, and LVM release for that. Um, but there are, I know, multiple companies who are using it internally for their firmware builds on their embedded 32-bit targets quite successfully occasionally working around various limitations, um, but um, finding it's doing what they need. So I think I've covered that. So in RIS-5, as you might know, um, there's, a, uh, there's a compressed extension. And how that works is, so in the standard RIS-5 instructions, the RV32i, RV64i, every instruction is 32 bits. Um, if you support the compressed extension, and then a, for a subset of those instructions, you're actually able to um, encode them and uh, encode them in just 16 bits. So this is not dissimilar to uh, Thumb 2 or um, various other compressed instruction set designs, except that you're able to freely intermix them. And we actually went, we had a fair bit of discussion about how to handle this in the compiler. Um, there are a number of design decisions, design choices that, um, that were considered. Uh, and one of the one of the questions you have to we had to answer quite early on was whether the um, whether the instruction selector would be aware of the compressed instruction set because of course if you have a 16-bit instruction for an ad it doesn't have the same uh, it has various restrictions on it such as you have to have the um, uh, there's a restricted subset of registers that you're able to access there's a uh, restricted immediate um, immediate field. And so there's one approach would be to try and uh, teach the instruction selector about all of these instructions and have that um, s produce it. Um, we actually ended up doing something very similar to what uh, GCC and the GNU assembler does, which is to actually handle it um, uh, basically exclusively as a very, very late stage um, conversion. So you go all the way through um, register allocation, um, f through the instruction selector, through register allocation, um, actually generate the in-memory representation of the machine instructions, and then we put it through a converter, which just um, is basically a, a table-based um, system that looks and sees and says, for this add instruction, can I convert it to a compressed add instruction? For this load instruction, can I do the same? And the advantage of this is that it, it, it quite substantially simplifies the logic throughout the rest of the back end, because you know, I mentioned that we have um, you know, those long lists of instruction patterns, and that's pretty straightforward, but there's a whole bunch of other target-specific analyses, such as you know, looking at um, you know, analyzing control flow and branching, and it becomes somewhat tedious if you have to ensure that all of that recognizes both the uncompressed form and the compressed form. And of course, it's a, an area where you can start to introduce errors but I think that's the starting point rather than the end point. So we have it so that, and it's not completely naive in that the uh, register allocator is aware of the fact that some registers are um, able to be accessed from compressed instructions, and so they would be chosen in preference to registers which, um, which, are, which are, can never be accessed from the compressed instructions. And... I kind of I've gone a bit a bit around in terms of how to uh, how much to go into detail on the RISC V memory model support, so I'll try and keep it somewhat accessible. Uh, it, it turned out to actually be a larger body of work than I was anticipating. Um, so as you may know, if you've been following uh, RISC V over the past few years, um, one of the early and probably most successful standardisation efforts in the RISC V Foundation was um, coming to conclusion on what the RISC V memory model should be. 
so the initial specification, it had, um, it had various things to say about the memory model. Then some researchers at Princeton and others, they sort of pointed out that um, actually like most memory models for most architectures, there were various things which were somewhat questionable. Um, and they quite successfully managed to get um, a whole group of uh, academics, um, practitioners and industry together and come to an agreement on the memory model which ended up being a, a, a sort of very relaxed memory model not dissimilar to ARCH64. And so what do you need to do to support that in the compiler? And it's actually, the basics of it is relatively straightforward because that I have the, with the C11 and C11 memory model, um, they, there are a number of primitives such as atomic add, atomic subtract, atomic load, uh, each with different memory orderings specified by the specified by the programmer, and all I really need to do is um, uh, is understand each of those. So this has been um, this uh, this is a compare and exchange, which has been uh, that would have been lowered from the uh, C C plus plus eleven atomic compare and exchange, and then I simply have to convert that to whatever the memory model people tell me is is correct, and then in theory you're done. But it's actually a little bit more fiddly than that. Uh, so in RISC V supports, um, it has two sets of atomic instructions. So you have uh, the um, AMOs, the atomic memory operations. So atomic fetch, atomic add, atomic subtract, atomic or, um, atomic XOR, and that's relatively straightforward, straightforward to support. But then there's some more general instructions. So load reserved and store conditional. So if you want to do something a little bit more complicated than just um, load a value, add it, and atomically write that back again, then you rely on these primitives. So load reserved reads a value, and it sets a reservation. Um, and the granularity of that res reservation is a kind of architecture is dependent on the microarchitecture. But let's say it reserves that cache line. And then you do some computation based on that. And then later, you do a store conditional. And if you're if somebody else wrote to that, say that cache line in the meantime, then your store conditional will fail, and then your program code, if it wants to be correct, should then loop back and try again and keep trying. And it's this, um, it's, it's the, it's this looping again and keeping trying which can be problematic, because that um, you want to ensure that um, that this this loop will actually terminate at some point. And so the RIS-5 RIS ISA manual specifies um, various restrictions on um, what code can be placed between the load reserved and the store conditional in order to um, ensure um, what's, what it calls the architectural forward progress guarantee. And the restrictions are pretty simple. It just means that you can't have, um, you, the, the main thing you can't have are um, spills or loads of stores from main memory or jumps or floating point instructions and that sort of thing. But the difficulty is that the compiler doesn't actually have an easy way of uh, reasoning about that, or reasoning about the fact that, um, say, this, for this IR construct, once I start to um, decompose it to um, RISC V instructions, uh, but, before, but before it's done various other analyses of transformations, it's not actually possible to specify um, that it's, this region should be left alone and there shouldn't be any spills and that sort of thing. So it's actually a, a problem which other architectures face and uh, ended up sort of implementing a, a new a whole set of different hooks for atomic lowering, which um, currently RISC-5 is the only user of, but um, I'm hoping that ARCH64 and ARM will move over. And essentially the approach is to um, lower to a... Um, to basically treat something like compare exchange as a, as a black box when you lower it. So we, we, we see this compare exchange, we lower to a, um, we load something which is a little bit um, still, uh, still very abstracted. So it's basically a, you know, we know it's a RISC-V compare exchange, but it's not converted to RISC-V instructions until um, a very, very late stage after all the other register allocations have been taken place and things like that, which ensures that there's absolutely no way that um, unexpected um, spills for the stack and that sort of thing are introduced. And although in practice, say, the other backends have managed to avoid this um, by, um, by having a slightly different code path for when you have a low opt for when you're targeting O0, there's, um, it, it's still a sort of theoretical concern, but I think it's, it's worth addressing. Oh, I'll get into that. So in terms of testing and fuzzing, there's been... Uh, 
I guess there's, there's a, few, a few approaches we take. So most of it has been done through unit testing, so targeted tests written against the uh, LVM has a whole infrastructure for this um, based on um, giving input IR and then writing effectively regular expressions on the output to ensure that the, uh, the assembly that you expected came out the other end. Uh, it has its, uh, there's been an increasing effort to start to test with, of course, real-world programs. Multiple people are um, compiling spec with, um, with Clang and RIS-5. Um, and there was some great work last year from some interns at Qualcomm on fuzzing, and this was targeted on the assembly parser, so specifying a grammar for RIS-5 instructions and then trying to generate um, a whole bunch of uh, you know, different inputs and seeing how, the, how, how it differs between GCC and um, the LVM assembler. Um, so that was using, uh, there's some related work for doing something similar with C. So that was inspired by, um, I think there's work some Google has done on A. So you specify, uh, you use sort of proto buffs to specify the, uh, uh, to specify your grammar and then um, using LVM's fuzzing library, you're able to instantiate, instantiate that with, um, you know, with legal and illegal values. Um, so one of the, another challenge on the compiler side, or I guess another task, is supporting linker relaxation. So if you have, so LVM has fairly small immediate sizes. Um, so if you have access to a, and of course it has fixed um, instruction lengths on like x86. So with x86, if you, if you want to access uh, global, you can stick the whole address there if you wanted to. Um, whereas with uh, RIS-5, you'd lower it to and say a, a couple of instructions, so you're to and uh, say lowering the upper the uh, loading the upper twenty bits, and then say uh, loading with a twelve bit offset. Um, but linker relaxation is when uh, you sort of you allow the linker to look at all of these instruction pairs and then decide and find those cases where actually you didn't need the upper twenty bits because it is within range of the say the twelve bits um, offset and then delete the original, the first instruction. And this is, uh, and if you'd use that approach, you have to ensure that the linker knows, uh, that the linker has access to full, to, to, every, to every fix up or relocation in the program, which effectively means every access to a symbol, um, because all of your instructions could be moved or changed. Um, Um, right, and I think, so supporting RISC-V's APIs, I mentioned, one of the challenges is that there are a lot of them. Um, the helpful thing is that they're actually basically all very similar and that they are um, fairly simple parameterizations of the uh, supported floating point regist register length and the general purpose register length. Um, so LVM is actually structured so that a lot, of the, a lot of responsibility for supporting the API is done in the front end. Uh, so this is something I've been talking to some of the people who've been porting Rust um, about. Uh, they, they're also kind of have the responsibility of uh, capturing cases where uh, you need to. So effectively, it, it's, it's a problem of um, say I have a a function which takes a unsigned integer and a signed integer. How do I convert that to LVMIR, which maintains those semantics? And that's mostly done um, for us in Clang, um, but this is work, work which also has to be repeated for, uh, for Julia, for Swift, and Rust and other languages. So one thing I did with this was uh, I've implemented a Python library which aims to be a, uh, I've got a RISC, the RISC-5 calling convention. I've, I've, initially I called it the calling convention golden, mo golden model. It's now called ABI COP. Um, so this is a sort of tool which helps to uh, test that the ABI is conformant to at least my interpretation of the RISC-5 ABI specifications. Um, there's more work to be done there in terms of randomized testing. Um, so it does a fairly naive, uh, has a fairly naive approach of doing um, randomized instantiations of um, function pairs, and then you can uh, take, take, your, um, take your caller, compile that with GCC, take your callee, compile that with Clang, and you sh hopefully they, uh, you, you get the result that you expect. Um, but there's definitely more that can be done there. So moving on to status and where we're at, I think the first thing I'd like to highlight is that uh, this started out as a project where I was the um, primary author and uh, 
Um, it's, it's expanded over time now, so we're at the point where we have multiple external contributors. I'm very grateful to contributions from companies like uh, Qualcomm, Embercosm, uh, Andes Tech, and others who've supported feature, who've added support for features like um, are working on the compressed instruction set, um, more recently TLS from Embercosm, and a, a whole series of um, assembler fixes and other things from Andes Tech. And I think we're starting to see as the LVM backend nears, um, nears the point where you're able to do things like compile the Linux kernel and Linux user space, there's a growing number of people who are interested in starting to contribute upstream. It's also been something I've tried to uh, encourage um, through giving tutorials and that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll mention, I'll give a link at the end of the talk. I gave a tutorial at the LVM dev meeting uh, at the end of last year, which gives a uh, a sort of a introduction to hacking on LVM and hacking on the RISC-V backend in particular. So where we're at with LVM, as I mentioned, um, there are multiple companies who are using it internally for their first two-bit firmware builds, but there are still a few limitations. So um, the TLS support is um, kind of in is in review queue and will hopefully soon be upstreamed. Um, so that's thread local storage, um, things like um, position independent code remains to be implemented and upstreamed. Um, and the, um, so the hard float ABIs, which are the ABIs that you want to use on Linux, um, aren't implemented yet. So the main block of that had been the 64-bit um, floating point code gen, but that was actually merged in the last few days. So um, imminently now be pushing forward on um, the hard float ABI support, which people um, want to compile um, you know, modern Linux applications. There is a Rust port and an active community around that, um, targeting the um, the baseline RB32i, so the well, the RB32im, I guess, whatever extensions you want to add to it. Um, so that's and then now, now that um, all the 64-bit stuff they need is upstream, they're now looking at porting that 64-bit as well. Um, uh, LLD, um, I should have mentioned also, that's another thing which um, I, have to, I, I have other contributors to thank for. So Andy's Tech did some work on adding support to RISC V to the LVM linker. And it's, so it's there, it works, it's somewhat early days, so it doesn't support some of the features that I mentioned, like linker relaxation yet. That requires a bit more design work. Um, but all of the basic relocation to support it, and you can use it if you want to, um, but you can just use the GNU linker. So we will be um, moving forwards with uh, work on the hard float ABIs. Uh, that's probably priority number one right now. Um, other work which has been going on is on the RISC-V vector extension. Um, so I won't go into much detail about this. Um, this has basically been led by Robin Krupp, who's a student at TU Darmstadt. If you've been following the RISC-V vector extension discussions, um, it's... Uh, it's an, it's an interesting compiler target, like ARM's um, variable, like ARM's SVE vector instruction set. Um, one of the basic um, design decisions is that your vectors are a, um, are a compile time unknown length, uh, which, is mic which is dependent on the microarchitecture. And so there's quite a few interesting challenges about how to support that. And there's been um, actually work from Robin and some of the other people working on vectorization LVM uh, working on how to support that for uh, for RISC V, SVE, and other architect and other vector architectures which take a, a similar approach. Now, there's uh, I think there's a talk later which will be looking at um, comparing code com uh, code size on RISC V versus other architectures, um, just comparing RISC V LVM and Clang versus GCC. Um, there's more that can be done to improve code compression, first to meet GCC and then hopefully to, um, to move beyond that. So I mentioned that, the select, that, that targeting the compressed instruction set is, uh, doesn't, it, but there's very little interaction with the, with instru at the instruction selection stage. So it's, it's not quite um, unaware of the fact that you're generating compressed instructions, but there's still not much, um, not much of a feedback loop there. Um, and there's definitely more you can do. So specifically, um, teaching the register allocator about, uh, about the compressibility of instructions, there's a potential for benefit there. So let's say that I have a series of instructions, all of which use the same virtual register. 
So I'd know that the, it has a, that they want to use the same value, but it hasn't yet gone through the register allocator. Um, if the register allocator is able to dynamically weight the choice of the registers, it can make a more sensible choice. Because if you know that one of the instructions could never be compressed anyway, then there's not much point in using one of the registers which is compressible. You'd be better off saving that for a case where um, you can actually improve code size. There's also, I mean, one thing we've noticed comparing GCC and Clang is that GCC's, uh, sorry, Clang's ordering of basic block, reordering of basic blocks can be quite aggressive. Um, so what it's trying to do is to ensure that uh, based, based on either um, profile data or um, static estimations, ensure that the, the common case or the hot path is, um, uh, is, is sort of linear in memory. Uh, which is which is great for you know for, uh, for cache effects and performance and so on, um, but if you're trying to minimise code size, that's not always what you want because that it means that um, your branch offsets tend to be larger, and so you tend to end up not being able to compress all your branches, and so tweaking this or adding ways of um, opting out of that behaviour is something to be further explored. Um, so I'm particularly interested in talking to anybody who's been working on different language front ends for LVM. Um, so I've had um, uh, there is a Haskell LVM backend as well, so I know they did a, a little bit of initial work, but I don't think there's been much activity there. Um, so I think Rust has been most active. Um, I haven't actually heard anything from the Julia or Swift community, but um, if you know people in that community who are interested, then please um, put them in touch. Um, it would also be good actually to uh, work together more on the um, ABI lowering and validation around that. So, as you know, RISC V has a sort of set of standard instruction set extensions which are defined right now, but there's also an ambition to extend that set. The RISC V vector extension was one example of this. There's also active work on defining um, new instructions for bit manipulation. And so I'm quite keen to work with that working group to um, provide support for the compiler before it's standardized, before it's actually standardized in order to get feed in order to provide feedback in terms of how difficult it is to support um, compilation to that extension um, and you know, how you're know, getting statistics on how often you can actually select these instructions. Um, so that'll hopefully be something we move forward on in the next couple of months. So I've suggested that the it would be worth the for the proposed extension if they could just pick an encoding, even if it's not final, so at least those of us who are doing those sorts of experiments can, um, can sort of cross-check our tooling to ensure that you know, the assembler's working the same way and that sort of thing. And uh, there's more stuff coming in terms of RISC-V standards. There's been talk about supporting um, floating point registers in, um, in general, in supporting floating point instructions on, general, on values held in general purpose registers. Uh, new ABIs for embedded targets, so ABIs where long, where um, uh, long double isn't 128 isn't a 128 bit float, and other changes. And so this will, of course, lead to you know, continuing work in the future. <coughs> and there's more more to do in terms of support for uh, target independent LVM features that we'd benefit from. So I mentioned code size, and um, the machine outliner is a very promising. Uh, feature that's been uh, pursued uh, more recently with ARCH64. So effectively this is the opposite to inlining. So with inlining um, you see that a, a function is used and that you don't actually need to have the external function call. You can copy it into your function. Um, with outlining you look and you find common code sequences and you, because you're trying to optimize code size you decide, oh, well actually I could pull this code sequence out to a separate function and it would be less expensive in code size to just have a, a call to it. And so it's obviously not positive for performance, um, but useful for people who are really trying to cram their code into a small amount of space. Um, and we're actively working on further testing on more real-world um, applications. Um, I guess in the last couple of months, it's mostly been people who are using it on their own code, code bases, and they've been um, feeding back up upstream when things work or they don't. Um, we're moving towards being taking a more structured approach to uh, to, I guess, proactively testing on uh, real-world programs and benchmarks. Um, and if on, the, on the 32 bit side, um, Zephyr, FreeRTOS, and moving towards Linux and FreeBSD um, on the 64-bit um, side. 
and uh, I guess a more automated comparison to other tool chains and I guess other targets as well in terms of code size, like comparing RISC-V versus ARM. So I guess I'm getting towards the end of the talk, but that is roughly the end of it. I should say that low risk is hiring. Um, we have about five positions open. We're um, sort of ramping up um, a lot more work um, to, in order to deliver uh, free and open source um, hardware and software. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, have a look and talk to me or um, Luis or uh, Philip afterwards. If you want to get started hacking on LVM, I put together this tutorial at um, the dev meet, LVM dev meeting last year, which a lot of people found helpful. Um, if you have problems with it, let me know. Um, and at that point, I'll see if there are any questions. Thank you. Correct. Yeah. So if yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, so the question. So the, the question was that. Sorry. Actually, so move on to the question, and I'll repeat the whole thing. Yeah. So the LLVM IR is not completely machine independent, and so if I'm going to write a front end for LLVM for a different language, how much work do I have to put? into supporting all the different variants of uh, RISC-V, especially 32 and 64 bit variants. Yep. Okay, so the question, so the question was, um, given that um, LVMAR isn't actually fully target independent, how much work is there in order to support um, a new front end in order to support the ABI? So it's something that we talked about in the LVM community back and forth for a while, um, because that it's, it seems unpleasant that people need to do this for each, for each new front end language and potentially get it wrong. Um, so what you basically need, so it depends on the ABI that you're, that you're targeting. So in the, in the case of RISC-V, you actually do need to understand um, for your, um, given your function signature, you actually do need to go through and count the registers and determine whether this value is going to be passed on the stack or not um, because for, it affects whether you need to add the sign extension or zero extension annotations and things like that. So there is... I mean, it's hard to quantify how much work there is in that. I guess writing something not that hard, uh, testing it and ensuring that it works, more work. Um, and I hope that that's an area where um, m more of us who are working on that can collaborate because the, the testing problem is basically the same. One approach is the approach I mentioned of um, doing separate compilation and compiling um, the caller and callee under different compilers or perhaps... Um, extending the ABI, ABI COP tool so that it does a very simple form of code generation in order to um, provide, um, I suppose, more of a, um, uh, even more of a golden model. Right now, it just spits out a sort of text description of what you're expecting. Um, but I'd be interested in talking more for anybody looking at doing that. Great, thank you. Great, so you have two minutes. One minute now. <coughs> Anyone else? Uh, so typically they um, they've standardised on, on LVM and Clang for whatever reason throughout the company. Um, they have toolchain teams who will support that, um, and so it mostly stems from that. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>